Well, this will probably be the most unusual message you hear from me this year. Um, not really a sermon, it's more of an extended exhortation, I guess. It started out as a two-minute announcement, and, and I just kept thinking of more things I wanted to say, and it kept getting bigger. Um, so, so here we are. Uh, back in August, uh, I asked, asked you all to give input on uh, the, the question of should we somehow set up an audio feed to the, to the conference room back there to get the sound from in here back there. And um, the feedback I got from you was kind of mixed. There were some people that said, wow, this is a great idea. It'll be good for nursing moms. It'll be good for uh, parents with fussy babies going in and out and changing diapers and things. Um, and, but then there was, there was some concern expressed also that, well, maybe, maybe this could, uh, in the long run, could be discouraging people from, from appropriate training of their children and, and there may be being some downsides to this. Uh, and so because of the mixed feedback, I was kind of slow to do anything. Um, but recently, Taylor uh, determined that, that, that VU here actually has already equipped the the rooms with the technology to just do this really easily. Um, and this, this thing on the cart here functions as a microphone, and then there's one just like it in the other room on the table that plays the sound. And I think it has a volume control and stuff in there. So we, Taylor tested it last Sunday, and it's like, well, this really works. It, you can kind of hear everything that goes on in the room, and. It seems, from a technical standpoint, that that's, that that's uh, effective. So, I'm ready to give this a try for a little while and see, see how we like it. Um, but my hope is we'll be able to capture the benefits uh, of having audio back there and, and avoid the potential problems. And, and to that end, I want to... Uh, bring some thoughts this morning on the subject of children in church meetings. Children in the church meetings. Now that's an unusual topic. I've never heard a sermon on that before. Uh, I don't know if any of you have. Uh, but it's something that, that seems especially relevant for us now, not just because we have new technology here, uh, but, but because... Because this is something you guys have been asking me about, it, pastor visits and stuff, and so I give you a few little thoughts and, uh, in a piecemeal way. So I'd like to give you a stronger, clearer answer to your questions. Uh, it's also just a fact that, that we're having more and more young children in the meetings, right? I mean, Lori counted, I think, 10 kids under two with two, now three more pregnancies that I know of. Um, in the pipeline. Um, I mean, this trend may continue, and we may soon be outnumbered <laughs> by, by little people. Um, it's also true that our meeting facilities here are far from ideal in managing all these children, and so that probably makes it more important that we be on top of, of things. Um, but this isn't just a message for, for young parents to tell them how to do stuff. This is really a message for us all as, as a church. Uh, it affects us all. Whether or not we have little kids, um, it will affect how well we worship God as a, as a whole church. And it'll affect how we interact, how we view each other in, in the body. Um, these, these precious children here, are not, are not just their parents' concern, but these, these children are concerned to all of us. I, I hope we feel that way. I hope we, we feel like they belong to us to an extent as well, that we love them, we care for them and their welfare. We want the best for them as they grow up. And most of all, we, we want them to know the Lord. Right? We want them to be saved to be our brothers and sisters forever in heaven. I want to talk today about five questions um, concerning children in the church meetings. Um, and maybe I can remember them all here. The first is, why, why have kids in the meeting at all? Uh, second is, 
what benefits would we expect from having kids in the church meetings? Um, thirdly, is what are appropriate expectations for the children's behavior uh, in the church meetings? Fourth is, is how do we train them to achieve those expectations? And then fifthly, what are just some encouragements we can give the parents that are in this process, a process that can be fairly challenging? So the first question then, uh, why have young children in our meetings at all? Um, some churches, perhaps the majority of churches, don't have little kids in the main worship meeting. right? The kids under 5, or the kids under 10, or the kids under 18 are gone. They're down the hall somewhere, they're in nursery, they're in Sunday school rooms, they're in children's church, youth groups, something else going on with the kids. And so the, so the grown-ups have it very quiet and reverent in the worship time. Um, why not just do that? Well, I go to the, to the difficulty of having little children right here in the church meeting with, with the grown-ups making noise and whatever. Um, well, the, the simple answer I would give is that the pattern we see in Scripture, the pattern we see in Scripture is that children are right in there alongside their parents in meetings. Children are included in things. And so, so I really right here at the outset, would just like to flip through and do a little Bible study and show you this, that it, it seems to be the pattern of the Bible and, and you know, God put this in there again and again. Hey, the children are there. The children are there. The children are there. Um, and I think it's, it's for our instruction as we contemplate these things. I want to start in the Old Testament of Deuteronomy uh, 31, and you, you don't have to turn with these to these if you don't want to, but I, I go ahead and will. Deuteronomy 31, um, this, is, this is when Moses had, had written out the, the law uh, of God right before uh, Moses died, and, and he says in Deuteronomy 31 verse 11, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place which He will choose, you shall read this law in front of all Israel in their hearing, assemble the people, the men and the women, and the children, and the alien who is in your town, in order that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law, and their children who have not known, will hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land. So that's Deuteronomy 31. He specifically says, I want you to read this law to everybody, including the kids, uh, all together. Joshua chapter 8, uh, just a little ways to the right in your Bible, is another example. Joshua 8, they just have now entered the promised land. Uh, they have all the people gathered at Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal there. And, and there's a, a, another reading of God's law. Uh, Joshua 8, verse 34. Then afterward he, that Joshua, read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, According to all that is written in the book of the law, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women and the little ones and the strangers who were living among them. So again, little ones, children uh, get included in this. Uh, another example uh, of, of children included is Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles 20, uh, verse 13. This is a, a time of national crisis. Uh, they're being, they, Judah is being invaded uh, by this foreign army. And, and Jehoshaphat, who's a good king, has, has, has gone to God. He's crying out to God with this urgent prayer for God to deliver them. So 2 Chronicles 20, verse 13, as, 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 as Jehoshaphat is praying, it says, And all Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. So this actually specifies infants as well as children in there. So it's, it's everybody. Everybody's in on this. Everybody's at risk. So everyone's participating in this special 
time of prayer in this crisis. We'll turn ahead a little further into history after the Babylonian captivity in the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 10 and verse 1. Ezra 10, verse 1, Now while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, and children, gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept bitterly. This is a time of national repentance. They had, they had sinned, and, and they, are, they are mourning for that sin before God, and it specifies the kids. The kids are included in this. Um, Nehemiah, uh, book of Nehemiah, just a few pages over, Nehemiah 8, uh, which happens at, you know, kind of at the same time as Ezra. Nehemiah 8, uh, verse 1. Here's another reading of God's law. It says, and, and all the people gathered as one man at the square which is in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel, Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square, which is in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So in this case, it doesn't say children, it says those who could listen with understanding. So... Maybe that eliminates the littlest kids, but the ones that can understand what's being read, they are there spending all day basically hearing God's Word. Um, could turn ahead in, in, uh, in the Psalms. Of course, there are various references to children. I just like this, this one verse. We'll just mention it as we go through. Psalm 34 in verse 11, this is one of David, King David's psalms. He says, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and love, loves length of days that he may see good? And then David goes on to, to tell how to have a happy life. How to be blessed by God. Well, who's he telling it to? He's telling it to the children. He says, come children, let me tell you this. I don't think he's just talking about his own kids. He's talking about the children of the nation. He's wanting them included. He's wanting to pass this message on. I feel that way in preaching. You, know, you want the children to hear it. You want the children. Children, let me tell you how to have a blessed life. How to know God. Another reference is in the prophet Joel. If you turn ahead, uh, Joel comes right after Hosea, uh, Joel is describing a time of national repentance, Joel 2, verse 15, and he he includes the kids, Joel 2, 15, blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. He says everybody, everybody uh, needs to participate in this. This is important to seek the Lord together. So that's some Old Testament references. Uh, What about the New Testament? Got anything there? Yeah, I think we do. Uh, Matthew 19. That'd be a good one to mention. Matthew 19. Uh, We're not here talking about church meetings. We're talking about the, the itinerant ministry of Jesus. But it's Matthew 19, verse 13. You're familiar with this story. It says, Then some children were brought to Him so that He might lay His hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to Me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And after laying His hands on them, He departed from there." I think we often think like the disciples thought here. We often think, these kids don't understand. Jesus Jesus is for grown-ups. Jesus has got all this ministry to do here. What are these kids in the way for? Get them out of the way. Come on. we got important stuff to do. But what is Jesus? He says, let them come. Let them come to me. I, I I want to talk to them a little bit. I want to bless them. I want to pray for them. So, so just the principle, you see, the principle, let the children come 
to me. Don't keep them out. Um, we've got a glimpse of an early church meeting in Acts chapter 20. And, and what I want to point out there is there is at least one young man uh, present. Acts 20, uh, verse 7. This is Paul's meeting at, at the city of Troas. Uh, on the first day of the week when we were gathering together to break bread, Paul began talking to them intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. That's a pretty long sermon. And there were many lamps in the upper room where they had gathered together, and there was a certain young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. As Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep, fell down to the third floor, was picked up dead. And then Paul goes on by the power of God to heal him. Uh, just to point out that Eutychus was there. Uh, it calls him a young man. We don't know how young. He, was he a teenager? Could be younger than that, some people think. Um, and, you know, it was a school night. But his parents apparently weren't worried about bedtime, and so they had this all-night church meeting, and Eutychus is part, part of it. Um, just the point, at least this young man, maybe a child, uh, was in, in the meeting. One more New Testament reference, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 um, and verse, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's something similar actually over in Colossians. Colossians 3 uh, says, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things. This is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they will not lose heart. So what does this tell us about children in church meetings? I think it says something kind of interesting. These, these letters, Ephesians and Colossians, were letters written by the Apostle Paul to local churches. And so Paul is, is expecting that his letter to the church is just going to be read in the church meeting. It was probably read in that church meeting a lot of times. You know, week after week they would read this letter, you would think. And, and it's significant that Paul speaks directly to the children here. He, he addresses the children. Children, obey your parents, and then fathers, you do this. Um, he does not say, hey, parents, when you see their kids, when they come back from Sunday school, you know, remind them that they ought to obey their parents. But no, he's talking directly to them. And Paul knew these churches. He knew how they did their meetings. He knew the kids were going to be there right alongside their parents. And so he writes it this way. And I, I think this is kind of cool to, to just, just imagine, because in both of these cases, he addresses the children and then immediately addresses the fathers uh, in, in like the next verse. And so you can picture this, right? So these, these families are together and whatever the church meetings were like. And, and so you can, you can imagine, you know, he starts talking to the children and all the parents are kind of nudging their kids and say, hey, Johnny, pay attention. He's talking to the kids here. And so, so Paul talks to the children and then he starts talking to the fathers. And you can imagine Johnny is now tempted to nudge his dad and say, hey, this is for you. And, and, and isn't that good? Isn't that a good principle that both both parents and children are together under the authority of the Word of God. You see that? It, I mean, within the family, mom and dad have a lot of authority. But all of us are, are responsible to God. All of us are under God's authority. All of us have to answer to God. Mom and dad have to answer to God just like the kids do. So you see that here in just the way children are directly addressed. And of course, in New Testament times, they wouldn't be having church in church buildings. They're having church in homes. Probably those, those homes didn't, didn't come with nurseries and Sunday school rooms. They're probably just all squeezed into you know, like one little room or something in there. You can imagine it's, it's, it's kind of a difficult, difficult scene. Families are surely there together. You can, you can imagine the, the parents are doing just like what some of you parents are doing, trying to keep the kids quiet and wanting to know, Shah, should we take them out and, and feed them or whatever. I think because of all these examples we just went through in the Bible, because those examples are so clear, that 
that really for most of church history, from the, the little bit of reading I did this week, uh, nobody, nobody really considered breaking up families in, in church meetings. Uh, you know, over the centuries, it just kind of assumed, well, obviously, kids are supposed to be involved, and so we're all together here. Uh, it wasn't until maybe the 1800s with the, uh, the, the Sunday school movement that there started being more of the you know, kind of separation of different ages and things like that. But, but for most of history, uh, families are just all together in the same worship meeting. All right, that's a long answer to the first question. Why have kids in the meeting? Answer, because it seems to be the pattern of the Bible. Uh, so then that leads to the second question, that is, what are, the, what are the benefits? What are the benefits that we would expect from this, from having kids around the church meeting? Why do you think God, why do you think God did it this way? Why do you think God kept putting kids in, in church meetings alongside their parents? Well, I can think of several reasons. Um, for one thing, it's because the things of God are for them too. The things of God are for them. You know, children, listen to me. Children, you, you owe God your worship and your thanksgiving just as much as your mom and dad do. All of us, all creatures, all creatures owe God our worship and praise, our everything. Uh, all of us, are to hear from the Word of God. This, this Bible is speaking to the children just as much as it's speaking to the adults. It's for the children as well. You need to hear, children, what God is saying to you. We just read it there in Deuteronomy 31, the, the very first text that we looked at. Uh, it, says, it, says, you know, it says, men, women, and children together, so that you may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of this law. They all needed to hear God's Word. It was for them also. You know, our greatest burden as parents is for our children to be saved. I mean, that's the thing we probably pray for more than anything else. Lord, would You save my kids? I want, I want them to know You. I want them to be in heaven. I want them to be Yours. I mean, don't we want to put our kids in the place where the light of truth shines the brightest? Where the Holy Spirit is already working the most of, of any place we know of. The corporate gatherings of the saints. You know, another reason why we want children in the meetings is so that they will see the examples, see the examples of their parents and the other saints worshiping God. I think this is a big one. You know, our, our children naturally imitate us, right? You know, your kids are going to talk kind of like you. Your kids are going to have your same attitude toward work. Your kids are going to, are going to pick up your opinion on a thousand different subjects. Um, don't we want them to pick this up from us? Don't we want them to catch this from us? This sense that, that God is. God is real. And God is important. And God is glorious. And God is worthy of our love and our life and our devotion and our reverence and our glory. That this is the great goal of our life put God in the supreme position. We want our kids to see that in us. And it's not just, not just the parents' example I think that's important, but it's the example of all the saints here. Because parents are sort of in a different category. But it's, it's really meaningful to see, well, here's all these other people too. God is real to them too. That makes, that makes an impression. We want our kids to hear the testimonies of, of many Christians that are saying the same things, that are confirming what they're hearing from, from mom and dad. Oh, we want, us, we want our sons to see the example of, of strong, godly men who love Jesus and, and who joyfully sing the praises of the Lord and are moved to tears by the things of God. We want our kids to see that. We want our boys to see men like that, right? We want, we want our daughters to see the example of, of godly women of, of all ages and all family situations. We want them to see 
Godly women who are, who are happy and satisfied and fulfilled in their role and mostly fulfilled in the Lord, you know. We want, we want them to see these examples. I mean, children are soaking up experiences all the time, aren't they? I mean, long before kids know the vocabulary of church, they're getting something. They're getting at least some sense of the, of the seriousness of the things of God, what it means to, 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 be, to be reverent toward the Lord. Oh, it was definitely that way for me. My, my mom and dad were saved at about the same, same time I was born, just a few months before I was born, I think. And, and so I got to grow up in church, you know, and, and I, I, I guess from just from the beginning, I was, I was, in, I was in church meetings. Um, by and large, even as a, as a really little kid. And, and I was greatly affected by, by the example of being around other serious Christians. It wasn't just my mom and dad, but it was their friends also that affected me. And this sense of the, the seriousness of the worship of God and the, the importance of the Word of God. I think it shaped my soul in ways, before I was saved, that, that still affect me today, my attitude towards spiritual things. It makes a difference. It has an effect. I thought too of that verse in Psalm, Psalm 145, uh, verse 4, it says, one generation shall praise your works to another. You know that verse, one generation to another, uh, praising God's work. There's other Psalms, similar Psalm 78 has kind of a big section talking about this you know, down through the generations, people worshiping God. And I, I, you know, of course that can happen in lots of settings. You know, that can happen at home or whatever. But, but isn't, isn't corporate worship time the most, the most natural, the most glorious place for that to happen? For one generation to praise God's works to another generation. And it just seems so fitting for, for, for all the generations to be together to praise God. God. All right, that's an answer to the second question then. What's, what are some benefits we'd expect from kids being in the meetings? Third question, what are appropriate expectations for children's behavior in the church meetings? So if we're going to have kids, going to have kids in the meetings, then how are they supposed to act? Um, well, maybe just start with, with well, what are our overall goals here? What are, what are the goals we're aiming at? Well, I think, I think there's three goals we're aiming at. I mean, the first is what I was just talking about. We want the children to be exposed to the meeting. We want the worship of God. Uh, and then the second goal we're aiming at is, is, is we want their parents to be able to worship God too without, without giving all their attention to the children. We want the parents to be freed up as much as they can be to enter into the meeting. And then I'd say the third goal is, is, is we want everybody else uh, to be able to worship God without being hindered too much uh, by the children. Uh, now, now, we realize that uh, kids, kids usually make more noise than, than grown-ups do. I think we're all prepared to give a lot of grace along those lines. Uh, but but a, a disobedient child um, can be a big distraction. And, and so, you know, we are concerned about, about how our kids uh, affect others' ability to worship God. God. So now in order for those three things to happen, those fairly basic, obvious goals, um, our kids are going to have to learn some things. Right? They're going to have to learn, be quiet, sit still, and pay attention. Now you might, you might use different terminology than that in your family, but I think that's pretty much what parents are saying to their kids. You know, some form of be quiet, sit still, don't run around, and and pay attention. Now the pay attention might come later on. Uh, you, you emphasize the first two first. Um, those are the basic behaviors. But, but the question then that comes up for parents is, okay, I understand that, but how much? How much of that can I expect of, of my particular child at, at his particular age? How much quietness, how much stillness, how much attention can I expect of, of him, of little Johnny here? Um, well, I can't tell you that. I cannot, I should not try to, try to, to do your job for you. Um, 
that has to be your parental judgment, understanding your child and in, in the situation and, and formulating your rules for your family, what, how you're going to handle things, what exactly you're going to expect. But I would say this in a general way. A general way. And that is, I think parents usually err on the side of expecting too little of their kids. Now, it's possible to expect too much. I mean, we just read the verse about don't exasperate your children. So, so it is possible to set the bar too high. I understand. But I think more often we, we tend to set the bar too low for our kids. Usually your child is capable of more than you think he is. Uh, it's not unreasonable to expect a, a 10-month-old, say, to sit on your lap for a pretty long time without fighting you and squirming and whining. You know, that's not unreasonable if that's your expectation. It's not unreasonable to expect a, a three-year-old to sit in the chair beside you without requiring a whole lot of attention and be, be pretty quiet and pretty still um, during, during a meeting. Uh, some parents provide uh, toys and books and crayons and Cheerios uh, during church meetings. Uh, I think we did that when our kids were toddlers. This is all fairly hazy in my mind what we did. Um, I, I, I'm really doubtful in hindsight that those things helped a whole lot, though. Um, you know, they probably contributed more noise and distraction than what they were we're really worth, but obviously do what works best for your family. Of course, as the kids are, are a little older and they're able to read and write a little bit, and they can participate more. You know, maybe the, maybe they you know they they have a Bible of their own. They can look up verses or or the follow the songs in the songbook or make little notes from the sermon or something like that. Um, different things to do. But again, the details the details you work out within your own family. You know, this is what. This is what we're going to expect this week of our children. These are the, the rules for them. Appropriate expectations. Just some thoughts on that. But then this leads into what's probably the biggest question on parents' mind, and that is, okay, well, how do we train this? You know, we've set the bar up here, and our kids are maybe down here. How do we get them up there? How do we train them um, to meet the behavior expectations uh, first thing I'd say is, is your child's obedience on Sunday mornings probably a reflection of their obedience the rest of the week. Um, during the week, is, is your child obeying the rules you set for them? Is your child obeying your verbal instructions promptly and with a good attitude? Well, if they are, then they'll probably do pretty well on Sundays also. I mean, it's just obeying your parents in a different setting. Um, before church meetings, of course, you want to make really clear to the children what the expectations are. Uh, you know, here, here's the rules. Here, you know, I, I remember for us, you're driving to the church meeting and the kids are in the back seat. And you say, okay, kids, what are the church rules? And they go through this, this, and this. And, you know, here's the expectations. Try to make that clear. And then, and then during, during the church meeting, of course, um, if the kid is, is obeying the rules, then great. Um, there might be a time, though, where they're not obeying the rules. They're disobeying. They know what the standard is. They're not doing it. They're disobeying their, their parents. And, and so then, then the question then is, okay, what do you do with that? What do you do with this disobeying situation? Um, well, what you're tempted to do is just like keep reminding them and keep shushing them and keep maybe threatening them, maybe count to 10 or whatever. Um, those things really don't work. They definitely don't work in the long run. Um, what your child needs, if the child is disobeying clear standards from the parent, child, child needs to be taken out and disciplined for that. Um, it's just outright disobedience. So, it, you know, however, whatever your routine is, typically the routine is you, you take the kid out, you explain to them real clearly, Here, here's, the, here's the rule, you know the rule, right? And here's what you were doing. And so uh, you're going to need to be spanked for that. And you apply the rod of correction 
uh, to the child, whatever instrument you use for that. And, and it's important to apply it vigorously enough that, that it, it has the desired effect. You know, there's a need, there's a need for brokenness and sorrow to be achieved or it hasn't done its job. Um, and then, of course, you give great comfort to the child. You reassure them of your love. You reiterate the rules and you come back in and try again to obey. That kind of process, that really works. Um, now, I spoke on child discipline, I think, last June, went through lots of scriptures. I'm not going to bring all that in. Uh, but those are, the, those are the basic principles that apply to this situation, just like to, to all other discipline cases. Now, I know some parents, I think some of you do this, you practice, practice church meeting behavior at home a little bit. Uh, during the week, some maybe you, maybe you have a family devotion time, and and it's like okay, we're having we're having devotion time here, and and here's the rules, and it's you know it's the be quiet, sit still, whatever. Um, maybe you do that. I've also heard of of you know you you line up the kids on the couch and you all watch a, an all be honest sermon together, and and you apply the the church rules to that, you know, and and so if. If those rules aren't followed, then you might need to stop and deal with, with the issue. But it's, it's training, it's practice. Uh, for just, just, you know, the child is learning self-control. They're learning patience uh, in that way. And that's going to really, really help them later. It can speed up the learning process for sure to do some, do some things at home if, if there's a need for it. You know, if, if there's a situation where your child needs a lot of instruction and correction, on a particular day, you know, they're having a rough day if, for whatever reason, then uh, it's probably best to, to, to handle that in the back room um, rather than just going in and out every, every 15 minutes if, if things are going, are going rough there. And I think that's where the, where the audio back there can be a real help. I mean, you can, you can transfer the situation back there and continue working on whatever the training issue is. You, you guys can just sit back there and be quiet and listen to the meeting and, uh, and issues can be dealt with along the way. The thing we don't want, the thing we don't want, and I, I feel strongly about this, um, is we don't want the back room to become a reward for misbehaving children. Uh, what I mean is you don't want to teach little Johnny that if he is bad enough in here, then he gets to go to the fun room. He gets, to go, he gets to go run around with his other misbehaving friends and make lots of noise and play with trucks. Okay, that's, that's going to be disaster from a training standpoint. You're just training him. There's a reward for misbehavior. Uh, instead, instead we, we want the idea of of, of using, using the facilities here to try to, try to encourage correction and training and, and reinforce what you're trying to teach rather than undermine what you're trying to teach. So we, we want the, the back room not to be the wild play zone, right? But to help our children develop needed self-control. So just some thoughts there on, on maybe the how-to on the, on the training process. Uh, and then the fifth section, and I think this is really important, and that is what encouragements are there for parents dealing with young children in the meeting? I mean, the process I just described in a few words is not that easy to implement. There can be some, there can be some real bumps in the road there for parents, and, and I, I want to give you guys all the encouragement I can in that, in that process. Um, when, when my own kids were little, like, you know, toddler size, we were in a church that, that had a nursery for the, for the very youngest kids. I think it was like under age two. So really young kids did have a nursery. And, that, and that's not a, not a bad idea. Um, I, I think for us, it didn't help us that much. Of course, of course right, at first it helped us because the one-year-old is, is somewhere else. But, but what it really did is it kind of just pushed forward the training issue uh, because, because once they hit two, they're back out in the meeting with the parents 
and, and they're used to playtime. And so now you have this chatty two-year-old that wants to play. And so then you've got you to lay down the law here. No, here's the rules. It's not playtime. You're going to you know, need to be quiet and so on. Um, I remember Sundays were really hard for us for a while in these things. Um, I mean, bad enough that I had the distinct thoughts that I am failing as a parent. I'm failing right here. Uh, this, is not, this is not working. Uh, you know, we're trying to discipline like we're supposed to, and it's not working. It's not working very fast anyway. Uh, and we're trying different things. And, you know, as, as Christian parents go, I think I've told a bunch of you this before, as Christian parents go, I, Lori and I were no better than average. Uh, when our when our parents, when our kids were little, I, I'm pretty sure we made all the mistakes that any of you have made in your in your parenting. And uh, but you know, we just persevered, however imperfectly, in just trying to do what the Bible said. And, and if you have a bad week this week, and you realize, boy, we really messed up, or inconsistent, what you you come back the next time around, and say, well, we'll try to do it right, and. Um, but at some point, it worked. You know, at some point, you, you get over the hump, or the message gets through, or the battle gets won, or however you you frame the, and 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 it, and it starts working, and um, and and you you realize, wow, we went through this whole Sunday, and there's only maybe one or two discipline things that came up, and then then wow, we went through Sunday. I think there's zero spanks today. You know, this is great, and praise the Lord, and you know, sense that you're that you've you've really made it out of the woods, and so the process can be tough, but the payoff is a real giant blessing. I thought of that verse, Hebrews 12, verse 11. It says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So it's not joyful, but sorrowful. So some of you are in the sorrowful phase, I'm sure. But, but look ahead a little bit. The promise is it's going to get better. And, and the end result is a real blessing. Differences in children's temperament can sure affect how things go. Uh, that's, that's reality. Different, you know, our two children are very different uh, in this regard. Um, but the thing I want to tell you is, is you can't use that as an excuse to tolerate disobedience. I mean, disobedience is wrong, whether it, regardless of which kid it comes from, right? And, and it's, got to, it's got to be addressed. You know, really what it means if you have a strong-willed child or whatever they're called these days is, is that it's just going to take longer maybe to get over the hump. But it's the same process. You just have to persevere longer and eventually, eventually you'll get there. All you can do is just be consistent. All my life I've heard uh, church moms talk about how hard it is to feel like you know, all of a sudden you're missing much of the church meeting. And, you know, for, for years beforehand, as, as, as a single person or maybe as, as, a, as married, no kids, it's like, you know, you're, you're, used to, you're used to one experience on Sundays and then all of a sudden there's children and, and it's, it's hard. It's hard dealing with that first baby and, and then, then, you know, disciplining toddlers or whatever. Um, and I, I sure sympathize with that. You know, really, it's, it's just one of the many costs and sacrifices of being a parent. Um, and I don't know there's much way around it. Um, but surely you can trust the Lord that he, He'll feed your soul in, in other ways. If you're getting less blessing from the meeting, He'll feed your soul. He won't, he won't leave you high and dry. Um, remember, too, that this is a fairly brief season in your life. You know, those, those Sundays that were really hard for us with our kids. I mean, it seemed like it was dragging on way too long. But, but we really look back on it and we can hardly remember. I mean, it's weird. I mean, it's just like 15 years ago. We were in the trenches dealing with this stuff and it was a big deal to us at the time. But now we can't even remember. It's like, what? How, how did that nursery work? And you know, what, what stuff did, what toys did we, did we do toys? Did we have food? What? 
You know, what were the rules? We can't even remember. See, it was a giant trial at the time. But then you get past that, and you, you're, you've got other trials to deal with, and, and it just fades away. And you look back and say, well, that really wasn't that long, where the really hard part was. Often, often even with large families, most of the difficulty, I think, is with the, the, like the two oldest kids, maybe. And then after that, it's, you've kind of got your system worked out, and the, the younger ones sort of understand what the rules are and fall into line a little better. Another encouragement for you parents is, is that the church is on your side. I know as parents, you are, you are extra sensitive to the sounds your kid makes. And you figure everybody else in the room is gritting their teeth at what their, their kid keeps what, doing whatever. Um, you should not think that the pastor or the rest of the church is like mentally condemning you. Uh, if, you're, if you're having a rough Sunday with, with your child, um, I mean, we all appreciate the, the difficulty and the struggle uh, that parents go through. And, um, and we only want to encourage you and affirm you and help you however we can in that, that process. Um, it's, it's always hard for us older parents to know when to give unsolicited advice about somebody else's parenting. It's just, it's hard to know. Is this just going to be offensive? I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, it's really what makes, what, what makes it more comfortable for both of us is if you ask for the advice, you know. If you, if you ask somebody, hey, you know, we're, we're kind of struggling around here. Do you got any ideas? Do you see anything we're doing wrong? You know, do we just need to kind of bear down and persevere? Or is there something we need to change? I mean, God's provided a lot of wisdom. Just right here in the room. People that have done it before. People um, that are just further down the road. Sometimes it just takes a little more objectivity, a little more experience, and, and somebody can see, well, I, you know, I think maybe this is a problem. And, and you know, yeah, it, it works. They're right. You know, that's helpful. The fact is we're not all equally good at this stuff. I, I already told you I was like average at best, I think. Um, we're not all equally good at it, and, and that's okay, isn't it? Is that okay? That's okay. We're also, not, we're also not equally good at prayer. We're also not equally good at love. We're equally good at holiness. or equally good at serving. or equally good at encouraging people. or equally good at evangelizing. or equally good at persevering in trials. And you know, really, I think all those things I just mentioned might be more important to the Lord than how much your kids are fidgeting this morning. See, we're, we're, we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. And that's how the Lord has made it. I, I've got to bear with your weaknesses and you've got to extend patience and forgiveness to me in my failings. That's the only way this works in, in the church. And it's not just that we, we're going to grit our teeth and tolerate each other. But God has set up the church in such a way that we need each other. We need each other. We all need every one of the other people here. Um, God has set it up that way. We need the strengths of others. We need the gifts of others. We need the, the, the encouragement and wisdom and different perspective that others have. We need their help. We need their correction. I mean, the, we are in this thing together. As one body, that's how the Bible pictures church life. We're in this thing together. It's not a competition. We're on the same team here, right? And by God's marvelous grace, by the help of His indwelling Holy Spirit, over time, we all have made progress together. I think we have. And we will continue by His grace to keep on making progress together. That's how it works. That's how the Lord has set it up. And I praise Him for it. You wouldn't want it any other way. It brings glory to Him, doesn't it? When, when we as a church really function that way and really do bear one another's burdens and love one another 
in those kind of ways. So just some thoughts here on children in the church meeting. Not much of a sermon, but at least some exhortations that maybe can be a help and encouragement to us as we go forward together. Amen.